So again, we're on page 247, chapter 6. I mentioned to you that CSS box model and actually showed you an example of it in an earlier lecture. But they talk about it in this chapter as well. All right? And this is the first chapter, well, actually five was, but you're not going to be assigned anything out of this chapter. You don't have to do the hands-on exercises. You don't have to do the end of chapter, you know, exercises, the practice or the hands-on. None of them. You don't have to do any of them. You can. I'd suggest that you go through and do the exercises throughout the chapter. Again, I realize people's time is precious. But the reason for that is it's going to be, it'll probably help you with the actual assignment that you're going to get that I'm going to hand out a little bit later. All right? So we talk, this is all about layout on a page. All right, I'm not, again, I'm not going to read that stuff to you. And again, there's the box model. I mentioned before, and that was one of the questions you saw on the test, that area around the content is the padding. All right? So the content is surrounded by the padding. The padding is surrounded by the border. The border is surrounded by the margin. Okay? That's the idea. And literally everything that you create on a web page is inside of a box. So even if I put a sentence in there that says, you know, good morning, my name is Jeff, however many characters that is, let's say it's 23 characters. There's 23 boxes in there, 24 if I put a period in. So I can go in and I can do that to any one of those characters if I want to or need to. All right. So they describe here what the content is, what the padding is, what the border is, and what the margin is. I mentioned this to you the other day, but I want to say it again. Basically, margin is set up just like padding. Top, which was 12 o'clock, right, which is 3 o'clock, bottom, which is 6 o'clock, left, which is 9 o'clock. And you can set, just like for, for padding, you can set all four values, all right? You can set any one value. So if I say padding, colon, it's going to really expect either, either four values or two values. So remember, and I know that I, you've already seen this, but I want to say it again. If I say padding, colon, and I say 30 pixels, 20 pixels, just like that, that means, again, looking at 12, 3, 6, and 9, if I only have two numbers, that means 30 goes for this one and this one, top and bottom. The 20 goes for the left and the right. Does that make sense? If I say just 30 pixels, that means do it, apply it to each one. All right? Or I can come in there if they all have to happen to be different, 40 pixels, 50 pixels, 60 pixels, and do them individually. So I can do them like that, but you don't normally see it like that if, if you know, then that's typically if you're going to just jack with them individually, then you'll do a padding left, a padding right, a padding top, and a padding bottom. You can do it either way. All right. So they do show you a picture here. They call it the box model in action. But it's very important that you do understand and are able to start laying out a web page. All right. And again, remembering too that just I can maybe put it on this machine. I can put bring up a web page and it might look great. And I might bring it up on a smaller laptop or I might change my resolution and it might look terrible. But that's not typically that big a problem. Typically, the biggest problem is, man, my website looks great in Chrome. I bring it into IE, and it looks terrible. All right. You know, people used to do that, and I used to give them the joke. I'd say, well, then don't use IE. All right. But then the problem is you never know if, if, if you're creating a site for other people, how many of those people are going to use IE. You don't know. All right. So you've got to shoot for the best you can. All right, they're going to talk about a little bit more about these flows, and what we've been working with so far is what they refer to here, it looks like on page 251, as normal flow. So everything we've been doing thus far has been normal flow, which means you put stuff out there, boom, 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 and that's how it appears. All right, if we look at these two examples that you see on the screen here or on the bottom of page 250, the difference between these these are two divs in normal flow. And they're actually, remember a div is one of those, we call, we'll call it a block level element because it's got a blank space before it and a blank space after it. All right. But in this example, what we've done is we've nested a div. We've put a div inside of a div. 
And that's why these two are separate, but these two are kind of joined together. All right. And they even show you, in fact, they have you do that particular exercise. So if you do the hands-on practice, you build that. All right. And again, I'd suggest that you at least look at it because the first, one of the first assignments that you're going to do for Chapter 6 isn't all that different than that. So the, the better the understanding you have of it, the easier it's going to be for you to do it. I mean, again, that's my opinion. You may or may not agree with it. All right. Probably the most important thing up to this point in the book is I would really make sure that you take a look at the, the, the uh, section, that's section 6.3 that starts on page 252 because it talks about the CSS float property. And that's how you can position things on a page. Float really isn't a good word for it, all right, in my opinion. But if you look right there, it says this figure that you see up on the screen right here, it says it shows a web page configured with float right. And what that meant was what we floated to the right was the image. We floated it to the right, all right. And it says float to the right hand side of the browser viewport. When floating an image, the margin property is useful to configure the empty space between the image and the text on the page. In other words, if you don't set any margin, this text might want run right up against it. And that looks very amateurish. And again, the author shows you exactly how you do this, and you end up doing it in the hands-on practice. On, on those pages right there, all right? And starts walking you through what you do. She has you lay different things out. You can float things to the right. You can float things to the left, all right? One thing to realize is if I set something up and I say float right, okay? And I, I keep putting stuff in and putting stuff in and putting stuff in, so I put in a bunch of images, I put in this, I put in that. It's going to attempt to keep floating stuff to the right. So not only can you float stuff to the left and float stuff to the right, but you can clear a float. And it's important to realize when you don't want to be floating anymore, if you want to go back to a normal flow, that you have to clear the float. And they talk about how to do that in here also. Okay? So notice it's not hard. Float colon left or float colon right. All right? And you can, when you don't want to float anymore, notice here, you can either clear left, you can clear right, or most of the time you just see clear both, which means just clear everything. Go back to totally normal flow. All right. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with this when you take a look at it. All right. And again, you might look at these two figures and think, you know, they look the same. No, they don't. This one has a lot more white space down here because we've set it up that basically, all right, or green space, I guess, that the text should be in a box that's as big, all right, and that box should be as big as the image. And it, it also results in, a big, in more white space here than what you see here. So they show you different ways that you can clear these floats, okay? Yes. It doesn't get rid of it, no. It just says from that point on. Oh. So what a lot of that's a good question. So if I if I put an image in here, all right, you know all the stuff that goes in there now. And I have set this up in my CSS so it floats to the right, and now I don't want it I don't want it to be any more floating. Typically then what you'll say is this. I'll put it a div with nothing in it, but I'll I'll maybe say clear. Okay. All right. In fact, not even the word clear. I'll I should do it like that. I should say Class equal clear. Slash div. So there's no code in there, but then in my CSS for the class clear, it would just say clear both. That's typically how you set it up. All right, does that make sense to everyone? All right, I'll leave that up there for a second. <clears throat> So there are different ways to clear when you're working with floats, and the author shows them to you. And then next, on around 255, she begins to talk about the overflow property. Did you ever hear the saying, trying to stick 10 pounds worth into a 5-pound bag? That's what overflow handles. 
So in other words, if I've got a certain portion of my screen that I've set up, so this is my area right here to hold a bunch of text, and I've got more text than it shows. Then I can use the overflow property to figure out what to do with it. So it says visible, as it says, the default value, the content is displayed, and if it's too large, it overflows. So it just goes on, you know, it allows you to put 10 pounds worth into a five pound bag, so to speak. Hidden, which literally just hides it, all right? Auto, as it says, it'll add either a horizontal scroll bar or a vertical scroll bar or both as they're needed and scroll, which will add a scroll, add both the scroll bars whether you need them or not. So you are in charge of what it's going to look like. All right, you say, well, all I have to do then is just make sure I've got enough room. Yeah, but you may not have enough room. All right. All right. Then they get into here, this looks like it's around page 257 talking about box sizing. I do want to mention something. They talk about it a little bit in the book, but almost not at all. Many developers find working with floats and clearing and stuff some of the most pain in the butt type of things to do in web design. They just don't like it. A lot of times, again, when you start doing this stuff on different browser types and different medium, it's very hard to do. So there's a fairly new thing that's come out in the last couple years. I'm going to put it up here and I'll erase it in a second, but it's called Flexbox. And it's basically being touted as being an alternative or another way of doing and working with this stuff that's not as hard. Okay? And you can look it up. There are tons of articles on it, etc. I'm not going to say any more about it unless the author mentions it. But to many people, that's going to eventually replace having to work with all this clearing and the like. I don't know if that's true or not. All right. So they talk about box sizing. And what they're saying here is, okay, when you're working, it says, uh, it's in the examples here, it shows you two different examples. You floated the elements. Each has got a 30% width, 150 pixel height, 20 pixels of padding, etc. In other words, that's all that can fit. So on, your, on a typical page, you could put two across. But if you change the size, you can change it so you put three across. All right? And what they do is they have you work through a practice in here that shows you how you can start doing some box sizing. All right? Is that that important a thing? It depends. Depends on what you're doing, you know, how intricate the site is, etc. Probably the most important part of the chapter starts on page 258. All right? You need a break? I'm asking. You need a break, or can we go for about half an hour yet? No one's saying anything, so I'll keep going. All right. When you work with two column layout, there's different ways that you can do it. This example right here is not a two column layout, that's one column. These, this, these are rows that you see here. So technically there's one, two, three, four rows, but there's only one column. In this second example, there are two columns. There's a column here, and there's a column there. And you'll notice that the header and the footer, all right, the header and the footer are not part of that column type of thing. So again, they're talking about having the nav bar on the top as opposed to having it along the side. That doesn't necessarily, when you set up a two-column format, that doesn't necessarily mean that along the left, that's always a nav bar. It can be anything you want it to be. In this chapter, we talk about a two-column layout. In the next chapter, we actually talk about a three-column layout. All right? I mean, I, can you have more than that? Of course you can. You can have as many as you want. Of course, if you're going to have a five, a, let's say a five or a six-column layout, that sure is not going to work on a phone. Even if you turn it landscape, it's not going to work. So they have a hands-on practice where they have you start and you have you build this and you notice how the navigation looks and then you configure it as two column and you change it so it looks like this. All right. Again, that's not all that different from some of the stuff that you are going to be doing in here 
in your ex in the exercises that I'm going to give you just in a little bit. All right. In fact, the what you find in this chapter is the hands-on exercises are unbelievably long. Some of them are three or four pages long. All right. So again, there is an example of a two-column layout. I, and as I mentioned before, notice there's column one, there's column two. You, typically, the way that this is set up is the header and footer are not in either column. Do you understand what I'm saying? The header and footer both stretch 100% of the size. Does that mean that if I wanted to, I couldn't make this thing go all the way up to the top and move that header over? Yeah, of course you could. It's just not typically done that way. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means typically it's not done that way. All right. And again, we've talked about this a little bit. Notice in the picture down here, this is your header area, not your heading. All right, not your head area. This is your header area. So what we just looked at with that path of light, this is where we had the path of light studio, and over here is where we had that flower, whatever the heck it was. All right, down here typically is where you have your copyright and your footer. You might have a, a link down there for click here for legal information or whatever. And then this area that's in here where the two columns are, all right, either your nav is going to be like this if it's a vertical nav or it's going to be right below your heading if it's a horizontal nav. But the area you see in white right here, that's your main area. All right. And notice the entire thing is inside of a div called wrapper. And if you don't know this, if you say, yeah, I, I, why, why have we been doing that? Why do we have this div called wrapper? You don't have to do it. But it's one way of grabbing everything at one time and being able to apply CSS to it at one time. And if you said, well, yeah, but that's the body. It's considered poor practice to, to be jacking way too much with the body tech. All right, that's why typically people stick a div in it that's called wrapper. You don't have to do that, but it's normally done. All right. And again, they have you come in here. This is what, they, what you work on in this chapter. It's called the Light, Howl, Light Island Bistro. So you see that's your header area. You see the footer down at the bottom, and you see the two column format where the column on the left has got your navigation, the column on the right has got your, your main area. Kind of an important point here. Does the order of floated and non-floated elements matter? The answer is yes. All right. Let's remove this. All right. It says a key to coding successful layouts with float is the HTML code, the element that needs to float before the other elements. And if you think it's not that important, if you do any of these exercises in the chapter where they tell you to float something, you might float something and then put some text in, reverse it. All right. And what I mean is take the float that you, if you're floating an image, let's say to the right and then have text, reverse the two and see what happens. That's how you learn this stuff. All right. Most people, whether you realize it or not, learn much better visually than they do from just uh, reading something in a book. Again, do I have to, you have to use a wrapper? No, but most people do. All right. Hyperlinks in an unordered list. We've talked about these. I actually showed you this a little bit in the first week of class. But the list style type, if you're working with an unordered list, you can use none disk, which is the circle that's filled in, circle, which is the circle that's not filled in, square. If you don't like any of those, let's say that you wanted to have a little star for every one, then you can bring in your own, your own GIF and do that. You know what a GIF is now. All right. So the first four that they show here, these are for unordered lists. The next four that they show are for ordered lists. Decimal, which is the default, all right, which is numbers, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, lower Roman, and there's an upper Roman too. I don't know why they don't show it, but there's an upper Roman too. All right. And there's a couple other things in here. List style image, image replacement for the list marker, and list style when you can use it for positioning. Most people equate that again with looking like this. Notice you may or may not be able to tell that's a square 
and not a circle. So they've changed the list style type. And here they've changed it from the default of decimal to letters. All right. And there they put their own GIF in there. All right. Two big things about this. Number one is if you decide that you are going to create your navigation as an unordered list, if you don't know this, probably 99% of navigation on websites are created as unordered lists. All right. A couple things that people don't like. First of all, if you're going to do this, whether it was vertical like this or whether you had it horizontal, you set the list style type to none. You don't want those there. This looks better. It just does. And now you also know with text decoration setting it to none, we can do that too, and we can remove the underlines. You should now be comfortable with doing any of that stuff. I haven't looked at the test yet for Chapter 6. I will. But uh, I'm sure that when we do the test review, that there'll be something, that'll be one or more of the questions that are on there. Again, the horizontal navigation takes this and converts it to this. How do you do that? Via the display property. All right. I want to show you something real. I'll, I'll try to do this really quick, but I think to me this shows it better than almost anything else. Um, I'm going to come in here just, I'm going to dummy something up. What I'm going to show you right now, um, the stuff that we're going to, oops, not this one that I'm going to show you, we're not going to actually go into until chapter 9, but I think visually it'll show you everything that you need to see with this. I'm not going to put the meta tags, etc. in there, so I'm leaving this really simple. When we get into chapter 9, we're going to start to create what are called forms. Okay, And I'm going to come in here, I'm just going to really quickly dummy up a form. didn't put in my beginning HTML tag. All right. If I come in here and I start putting in a form, so I'm going to say it to say this. Input type equals, uh, I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. That's the next line. Label four equals first name, first name. So again, this is the kind of stuff that we're going to be doing when we get to Chapter 9. This will be an uh, unbelievably simple form. So I'm going to put in a first name. I'm going to put in a last name. And I'm going to put in a button that says Submit. screwed up, you're going to know real fast anyway. All right. So I bring this up. Okay. Well, I forgot. Yeah, a couple things are screwed up. That's good. I don't need that. And I want to put a, let's put a couple line breaks here. And a couple here. This isn't real bad. They, they line up pretty well. You may or may not be able to tell, but there is actually a little, this is a little farther to the left. But once I start coming in here and I start saying this, so I come back in here, and I add, for example, address.
and this one should really show it. I'm going to put in here phone. All right. What happens is you start building it, and you see it doesn't look very nice. Again, it's not terrible, but it doesn't really look very nice. Okay, so I can come back up here and I can go into my head section and I can say style, you know what all this stuff is now. And I can tell it for labels, I want it to display block. Now, is that pretty obvious what we just did? That actually shows better than anything I've ever shown you what a block element is. All right, because it puts it on another line. Okay? And again, the reason that I'm showing you that and what that has to do with this is that's the display property. Okay? And by default, when you go to display your list, it's going to look like this because it displays block when you do an unordered list. Each list element is a block element. It goes on its own line. Does that make sense? But if I change it to display inline, or I can even say inline block, but I got to have the word inline in it, then it looks like this. See the difference? All right. And they have they show you, they have you configure this with CSS. So again, especially if this confuses you at all, I'd say it probably would be in your best interest to go in and go through these exercises, even if they're not assigned. That's why, like I said, I don't want to go any longer, if ideally, till 10 or so today, you know, 10, 30 at the latest, but give you an, an hour and a half or so to work on this. That's how you're learning, all right? Hopefully, you're absorbing some of the stuff I'm giving you, but you're learning the most by doing it yourself. All right, the next are the pseudo classes. And what the heck is a pseudo class? Well, let's make it real simple. Let's go right to the same thing we just looked at. In fact, I don't want to put it in the form. See the Rankin homepage, right? You all know what that is. I click on it. The file was not found. Well, it probably needs the HTTP. I don't really care, but I might have to in order to be able to show you this. All right. Now, it is going to go there, but do you, can you notice the color has changed? All right. The key point and the reason for showing you that is that all works with these pseudo classes right here. These pseudo classes, pseudo means false, okay? I don't know exactly why they got that name, but they did. And if you decide you're going to set these, let's look at each of them. There's five. Link, the default state for a hyperlink that you have not clicked yet. You know already it's blue and it's underlined. That's the default. You can change the color on that. You can take, you can remove the underline with text decoration, none. And you can go in and you can change the color. How do you do that? You use the link pseudo class to do that. All right. Then we've got visited. That was the purple one after we clicked it. Okay. Focus. Triggered when the key, the, the hyperlink has the focus, which means typically you've clicked on it, but you haven't let go yet. All right. Hover, when you take your mouse and just hover it over it. And then finally, active, so it's when you actually click the link. Now, the key thing to remember, and you don't, again, is this going to be on the test? I'll let you know. But the, the key thing with those five is if you decide you're going to set all five of them, they have to be set in that order. So you have to do link, then visited, then focus, then hover, then active. If you do it in reverse order, for example, the last one's going to overwrite all the other ones. All right, so it has to be done in that order. All right.
Okay. Position property. And we probably went through that too fast in the last chapter, but I want you to see this stuff that's in here. Notice when you position something on a page, you can do it in one of four ways. All right? You can do it static, which is, means if you, you didn't do anything, it's just going to fall where it would normally fall in the mainstream of things. Have you ever gone out to a website? This, this won't be an example, I'm sure. But have you ever gone out to a website where you keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and it might be really long, and on the top of the page, they've got some kind of headings up here, but even when you scroll down to the bottom, you can still see the headings up on top? All right, because that's pretty important stuff and you don't want that to change. That means you took that heading stuff and you had that fixed. You said you didn't want it to move. Okay. Relative, as it says, it configures the location of an element relative to where it would otherwise render in the normal flow. So if you want something to always appear, let's say that you've got some kind of a background image and it's a real light image but you want to make sure that it always appears on a certain spot in the screen. Maybe not necessarily in the middle. All right, you can do that. You can put, position that then relatively. And the last one is absolute, which means it does not move. So if I've got a web page and it looks like this, when I put stuff on there relatively, it'll put it here, then here, then here, then here, etc. that kind of thing. But if I have something and I put it in there and I set it up as absolute, and I put it right there, that's where it goes. And you've got to be real careful because if you don't work your way around it and you put in your other stuff, it'll kind of go right over it. All right. And there's a thing we're going to talk about in a later chapter that's called Z-index that can help that from happening, or help keep that from happening, I should say. And again, they show you some examples. They have you do another hands-on practice in here. And might not look like a big thing. See that? Where the mouse is, where it says sign up, that's a hyperlink. You can use CSS to take a hyperlink and make it look like a button. You don't have to do that, but people are typically, you know, fairly cool at clicking buttons. Oh, look, there's a button to sign up. Now it just looks like a button. If you didn't put the, the rounded corners on it and you made it kind of the gray background, you could make it look exactly like a button if you wanted to. All right, again, you can do that with CSS. And they have you do some of this again in the next hands-on practice. So they have you change them so they look like this. And again, you might look at that, I might look at that and go, those are really ugly. I would never want to create links that look like that. That's not what's important. The idea is that you can, and that could be any background color you wanted, and the text could be any you know, color that you wanted. Plus, notice that they have it set up so when you highlight one of them and you're hovering on it, notice how the color changes. All right. So they have you do a practice with a, with a two-column layout. Again, this might be the, one of the largest practices in the book. It starts on 268 on the bottom of the page. It's 268, 269, 270, and 271. All right. It's four, four pretty complete pages. This is what you get when you get done. Notice they've taken the navigation and moved it from the left to where it was over to the right. And it's still a vertical. It's still vertical. But now when you highlight one of them, it's got, it goes to reverse video almost. So instead of blue with white writing, it's more whitish kind of gray with blue writing to show which one is active. All right. Header text image replacement. It says here, sometimes a client may have a specific font typeface other than website, say font, that they would like to use in the header. In other words, you know, you're contracted by some company, and the person running the company says, you can make this any way you want, but this is our logo. Somebody created the logo for them, in other words. And it might have some god-awful font that you don't agree with, but that's what they want. All right? So what they're saying with this header text image replacement a lot of times what you can end up doing is you, you'll, it'll be an image. Literally, the whole thing will be an image, and you can play around with it. So it says here, a popular technique called header image replacement allows you to configure a header banner image that displays text along with an H1 element. So you've got a logo and the element. It says the key is that the H1 text does not display 
within the, brow the browser viewport, but is available to assistive technology and search engines. So in other words, you can have that. So if someone is blind, you can set it up to, to give them whatever information you want to give them. I'm not going to click it, but if you click the link right here, it brings you to that CSSTricks.com, and it's a pretty good article. All right, I'll look through it a little bit. All right. The next thing that they have you do in here, and again, I, I'm going to say this, you may or may not agree at all, this might be one of the more fun things that you've done in here in this book so far. They have you literally build an image gallery. And when you build an image gallery, there are many ways you can do it. You can do it just using HTML and CSS, which is what they have you do here. You can build it with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, which we will do some of that when we get to the JavaScript portion of the class. And you, or, or you can build it using CSS, HTML, and a JavaScript library called jQuery. That's probably the easiest because you put in one line of code. You tell it basically that it is a slideshow presentation. Boom. And it does every, it configures a lot of the stuff for you automatically. All right. But in this example, as it says, you create the web page shown, which groups with groups of images as captions. All right. It says the images float on here. Okay. And they run through everything that you're supposed to do. I think, again, it's a really good example because it starts to show you how you probably want to lay things out as a developer or a way of laying things out as a developer. Now, we talked a little bit earlier, but now they're in the next, I don't know, four or six pages, they're really going to talk about this static positioning versus fixed positioning versus relative positioning versus absolute positioning. These are things I, in some form or other one, two, three, or all four of these will be on the next test. I don't know. Like I said, I'll look at it later. All right. But you have to, as a developer, as a web developer, all right, you have to understand the differences between static positioning, fixed positioning, relative positioning, and absolute positioning. All right. We've started to go through over them already. Notice again, static is the default. It just says put stuff in where it would normally fall. That's all. It's like you didn't, it, it, look at it this way. It's as though you added stuff onto a web page and you didn't even add any CSS. Okay? That's probably the easiest way to look at it. Fixed? Well, if we decide that regardless of how you scroll this web page, maybe it's a fairly long page, we want right here where I've got the, the mouse going, that's always going to be where your menu is. Then that's fixed. As it says, it causes an element to be removed from the normal flow and remain stationary. It does not move. Even as you move your way throughout the site, it doesn't move. Relative, as it says there, you change the location of an element slightly relative to where it would normally appear. So you want it moved a little left or a little right or a little top or a little bottom type of thing. All right. And a lot of times, especially when you're working with relative positioning, You've got a website that looks almost exactly the way you want it to look, but you get into where you you're into what's called tweak mode. You're tweaking it. It's pretty good. It's like 99.8% of the way there, but I, I want to move this over a real little bit, except that's when you start using a lot of this stuff. All right. Then absolute positioning. So they've absolutely positioned this paragraph on the page. It says this paragraph is 300 pixels wide, so that's the width. Here to here is 300 pixels. It's 200 pixels from the left, so that's there, and it's 100 pixels from the top. Okay. And they have you, again, do this practice with it with the hands-on. All right. Believe it or not, we're almost finished. Just a few more pages. They talk about debugging techniques then, starting on page 280. I'm not going to bore you with, with, with history. But, you know, literally there was a, maybe I told you this before, there was a bug in an old computer, literally a, a physical bug, and that, that was the first computer bug. There was a moth that had crawled into a computer, and that's why the, the, the instructions wouldn't work. They got the, the, the moth out, and then they ran the program again, and it worked. That was the first bug. 
That was the first example of debugging. All right, but they give some really good things in here. So you you know you go in and you 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 do an assignment that you're given, and everything looks pretty good, but but for some reason just a real little part looks funky, and you can't figure out for the life of you why. All right, so they give you some hints in here. First thing you might want to do is to go out, validate your your uh, HTML, and then validate your CSS to make sure there's nothing weird that's in there. All right, so that's first thing. Next, this might not sound like a big thing. It is. If I break my, my web page up so that it looks like this, let's say I've got one of those two-column formats. So right here, that's my header. Right here, that's my footer. And let's say that the way I've set this up, there is my nav, and that's my main. Everybody cool with what I just said? So you broke it up into those four components. Well, if I'm having problems and can't figure out why, I can take my header and make it green. I can take my nav and make it pink, or whatever that is. I can take my main and I can make it blue, and I can take my footer and I can make it brown. So I can put each one of these in its own div if I want to, or and or with using CSS, I can do that. That's often a really good way to debug. You know, of course you change the colors back before you are done, but it allows you to kind of segregate this stuff into, into four pieces as opposed to have it be an integration of those four pieces. All right. You can put temporary colors. You can put temporary borders on if you want. Does everybody realize right there, if you look at this line that I'm highlighting that's now in blue, that when you put comments in, in CSS, in a CSS file, so a file that ends with .css, it starts with a slash, star, and it ends with a star slash, whether it's one line or multiple lines. So in other words, here's CSS comment. So if I wanted to make a CSS comment, it's slash, star, and it ends with star, slash. With an HTML comment, it looks like this. Right? And that's whether it's a single line or multi-line. But that's stuff by now that should be committed to your memory. Okay. On the bottom of the page here, it says, where can I find out more about CSS? Notice the first one that she lists there is CSS Tricks, and I mentioned that to you previously also. That's a really nice site. They've got a lot of demos and stuff like that out there. All right. Then they jump back into, and they start talking a little bit here. It says, more HTML5 structural, structural elements. And they talk about some of these. We have looked at header. We've looked at footer. You've at least been exposed to main and nav. Those are four of the main HTML5 newer elements. But there's also section, article, aside, and time. All right. Section is kind of like if, if I was going to, um, let, let's say that I was going to separate a, a web page out and I was going to have little sections. All right, Maybe like little mini paragraphs or mini chapters. I could put each one into its own section if I wanted to do that. All right. An article is just that. It might be a blog posting. It might be something else. It might be you know, an email. It might be just another article. I don't know if you've ever done this because I don't know, again, you know, how often or how, if you've ever read a regular newspaper, if you get all your stuff online, but in a newspaper, you know, if you had a newspaper page that looked like this, and let's just say that the main article on the page, it said something along the lines of, uh, uh, girl saves dog, all right? And here they've got a picture of the girl and the dog, and here there's a whole bunch of article, okay? Then along the side they have, you know, Mary's life. And they've got another article there. Okay, that's an aside. So it's a little thing that it's, they call it tangential. In other words, you actually could have had this article without this, but it wouldn't have, you know, why would you put it in there, that type of an idea. But the story is just fine without that article. All right. And a lot of times with the sides, those are what you see along the side. Not a nav like we've been doing, 
but an article like that. Okay. So if this was the home page for a company and I had the logo here and the company information, this might have either a list of URLs, you know, popular URLs for the site, or maybe com company's history, or maybe our CEO type of thing, where they would have an article about the CEO, that kind of thing. The time element that they mention is literally the idea, the reason for coming up with a time element is to make it easier to sync stuff up with the actual computer. All right. All right. Again, you'll notice there's another hands-on. They have you build this. HTML5 compatibility with older browsers. This literally is about the last page that's in here. All right. Right here, this line, a little hard for you to read probably, but if you see it, if you've got your book, it's on near the top of page 284, or 285, I'm sorry. And what this does, that line, is it says if you're using IE8 or lower to view this web page, it might not view correctly. So what it's doing is it's saying any of those HTML5, this is all HTML5 stuff, header, main, nav, footer, section, article, figure, fig caption aside. All nine of those things are HTML5 only. But if you're using an older browser, it probably doesn't support HTML5. So it says whenever you see these HTML5 tags, just do a display block on them. And you know what block is because I showed you that earlier. All right? All right. It's also sometimes put in like this. This is referred to as a shim. I've actually heard it called a shiv instead of a shim. And what it does is it says if you're using an older browser and you come across a tag that you don't understand, ignore it. Does that make sense? That's basically what it says. All right. There's one last thing I want to show you because we have reached the end of the chapter, but I, I don't know if you know this or not. So I very quickly want to show you this, and that is this. All right. Um, I'm going to go back to this, art, this thing I showed you before, and now that we know how to comment out with HTML, I'm gonna comment that out. All right, and I'm gonna throw just a couple things in here just because it'll make more sense when we do this. All right, hopefully you would all agree that since I commented this out right here, since I commented that out, if I save this, if I look at it right now and I run this, okay, I hopefully you'd all agree there's, there's no CSS on there right now. Would you agree with that? Yes or no? Everybody, yes or no? Anybody who disagrees with that? Okay, me. There's CSS in there. And the CSS that's in there is provided by the browser. This is going to look a little differently if I bring this up in IE, or it's going to look, and it might not be much to the human eye. You might not see anything. All right? But the reason that I'm telling you that is typically, and I want to show you that here. There's a gentleman who's been real big over the years in CSS. His name is Eric Meyer. And he developed this file, and it's all right here. The whole thing is right there. That's called the CSS reset file. And what does it do? I, it's much, again, much easier to show you. I'm going to grab his file, and he encourages you to do this. Copy. And I'm going to come in here, and go ahead, it's on my desktop. I'm going to put that in, and I'm going to save this. Oh, that was interesting. Where did I say? Oh, I saved it right below where I was. That wasn't good. Wow. There we go. I'm going to save this right now to my desktop, and I'm going to save it as reset.css. All right. 
And notice what it's doing here. It says take almost every tag that exists. I mean, that's most of them right there. Have there be no margin, no padding, no border. The font size should be whatever it would be you know, by default. And it should inherit from the parent. We'll get into that in later chapters. And this is just on alignment. This says for the older browsers, we already talked about display block. And what it's basically doing is it's turning off anything for lack of better words. So we've got reset.css. Now, I'm going to come into our area up here, and I'm going to use the link tag, link rel equals style sheet dot CSS, oops, uh, href equals reset dot CSS. All right? So you saw what this looked like. This was the last iteration that we had. Now look at it. Oh, come on, don't make me a liar. Is it just supposed to be regular What's, yeah, it really it would be better off if I did this, if I remove the form. Okay? If I commented out the form and just put a bunch of paragraphs in. What it's supposed to be showing, I don't know why it's not, but what it's supposed to be showing is everything literally just pushed off to the left-hand side and virtually no margin. And everything looks kind of like generic, ugly text. Ah, thank you. That's re still. Oh, I misunderstood then. Yeah, rel equals what was here? Rel equals style sheet, like that. All right. See the difference? And the reason I'm telling you that, and I don't even know if the author mentions it in the book, many times what you'll see on websites is the first link that, an, uh, that a website developer will have in there is one to a reset file. Because that means that every single thing that's in there, every H1 tag, every paragraph tag, every this, every that, every tag that's in there, the author is going to set the size, the author is going to set the color, the author is going to set the font weight, except everything. So that's more work you have to do but the idea is that makes sure that you're starting with a clean slate. That should look exactly like that if I run it on a different type of browser. All right. So I don't know if that makes sense or not, but hopefully it does. All right, so we have finished the chapter. Okay. Again, you're not, you're not assigned any of the exact work that's in here, but what we will do next week just to get everybody back kind of in the groove or whatever you want to call it. When you come back here next Tuesday, is we will do the exercise again for the path of light. I know with some of you now it's driving you nuts. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to configure. We had the links up here before. We're going to configure them along the side, make them look like buttons. All right, so you can see how it's going to change. The majority of the stuff that we change in here, hopefully you realize, is, is going to be changing the CSS. All right, and different CSS properties. So let's take a break. It's just about 10. Come back at 10, 15. I'm going to give you the next assignment. We'll talk about it for about 15 minutes max. And you'll have the rest of the period by 10.30 on to, uh, to work on whatever you need to work on then. All right. I'll try to grade the tests then starting at 10.30 so I can give them back for you to look at. Again, if you haven't turned me back in, a couple of you still have not, the old copies of your tests and stuff, please get them back to me as soon as you can. Okay?